Today we're going to talk about chapter three, which is social cognition and how we think about the world around us in our social world. Now, what is social cognition? So social cognition is how people think about themselves, how they think about their social world, how we select, interpret, and remember the information and social information around us to make judgments and decisions. Now, this idea, this idea of social cognition is really important because it really dictates how we uh, behave in certain situations, how we interpret those situations, and sometimes how we incorrectly interpret situations which change how we behave. It's a central topic in social psychology because it's so important to how we navigate our environment. We're constantly trying to be accurate in terms of how we view the world and our impression of the people around us. The problem is, though, that sometimes we're actually wrong when it comes to judging people around us, judging people's intentions, and how people act. And when we're wrong, sometimes that can paint some pretty pretty bad consequences for those kinds of judgments. When we think about how we navigate our environment, it's important to think about the kinds of social cognition that we use to form those impressions of the people around us and decide to engage or not engage. So the first important thing to think about is automatic thinking. Now, automatic thinking is what we do when we're sort of on autopilot, okay? It's quick, it's involuntary, it's effortless. We don't really have to think about the situation and really break it apart and decide what we want to do. It's it's our autopilot so that we can navigate our environment quickly and judge threats quickly. So if you walk into a room and you're sort of on this autopilot, automatic thinking, and there's a bunch of signs that tell you that you're in danger, you don't want to have to sit and think, oh, I see smoke, oh, there is heat, oh, my conclusion is there must be a fire. When you're on automatic thinking, things like you're in danger come very quickly because that means that you can then act very quickly and it can save your life. So automatic thinking is very important in in situations because it is helpful to adapt to your environment and to stay alive. So if you're in a situation and people around you are screaming and running out of a building, you might very quickly turn the other way and say, okay, well, I'm not going to go there because that looks dangerous. If we were to engage in um, a sort of what we call controlled thinking, which is more effortful and deliberate with every tiny little thing, it would just take us too long to navigate our environment. And also it would probably end up putting us in dangerous situations that we end up not being able to get out of. So that controlled thinking, that's that thinking about ourself, thinking about ourselves in terms of our environment, deciding what we want to do, where I want to go, do I want to engage with this person, um, Maybe you see somebody and you go, oh, you know, uh, that person looks friendly. I think I might go ahead and talk to them. You know, that's a more controlled thinking. You're thinking about your environment. You're putting effort into it. You're thinking about pros and cons. You're thinking about your next step. So these two kinds of thinking don't necessarily uh, uh, occur in, in a sense, separate from each other. You know, we, we engage in automatic and cold controlled thinking together uh, all, all, all of the time. So we have some element of sort of autopilot on, and then a, and we always have some element of controlled thinking. But the idea is, is that we don't have to engage in controlled thinking for every single little tiny thing. So let's look at this autopilot low effort thinking. So we can size up situations pretty quickly uh, to determine is this something that we want to uh, um, participate in or not? Do we want to go there or do we not? So you can look at a, a, a situation and go, is this a college classroom? There, You don't really need to think about, oh, okay, there are desks, there are chairs, there are people sitting in the seats, they look older, this must be a college classroom. You know, you can walk in and immediately know it's a college classroom um, versus a frat party, for example, or a party without really having to engage in much effortful thinking at all. This is very low effort thinking. Um, 
Now, uh, again, sometimes engaging in low effort thinking can be helpful. Uh, most of the time it's, in, it's helpful because we're able to uh, decide what we want to do in terms of the next step. But sometimes automatic thinking can lead to misinterpretation. So if you see this man on the street, okay, um, and you're going to form some very automatic thoughts about this particular person. So, um, you know, you might immediately think that the person looks homeless. Um, maybe they're jobless. You might look and say, um, okay, you can go kind of a couple of different routes here. You can sort of uh, be empathetic, right? You can say, oh man, that guy, um, you know, I had an uncle who was in this situation and he was down on his luck and this person needs help. Or you can go the route of, you know, maybe you don't feel sorry for them at all and say, um, you know, maybe this person has an alcohol problem. Uh, you know, maybe they've, they've done this to themselves. Um, maybe this person is, uh, you know, uh, did this, uh, um, you know, quit their job or, or is mentally ill, or there's all sorts of thoughts that can go in your head that could be incorrect about this person. And your thoughts will then dictate potentially how you feel about this situation, whether you're going to maybe, uh, you know, contribute to the money here, um, or maybe go buy him a meal versus, um, passing him on the street and not even looking at him in the, in the eye. So, you know, if we think about how we approach people and approach situations and how that dictates our actions, we engage a lot of times in this automatic thinking process to determine our next step. Now, with this automatic thinking, we're going to talk about something called a schema. Now, schemas are very important to understand because you're going to hear about schemas for the rest of the class. All throughout social psychology, we're going to talk about schemas and why they're important. So these are these mental structures, these shortcuts that we use to organize our information and knowledge about the world around us. So it's it's basically our ability to put things in categories and boxes. So schemas are come from a, a cognitive process that we use um, that we are sort of born with, okay? So this cognitive process allows us to do a lot of things. One of those is to build language. So if you look at a, a young child learning different words and learning how to speak a, a particular language, let's say English, okay? And you see a little kid, maybe, you know, a three-year-old or a two-year-old and say, the little, the little kid says, um, okay, I see a furry animal. That animal is dog, okay? And then uh, you say, great job, that's a dog. Very, very good, okay? And then they see another furry animal and they point to it and they say, dog. And then you say, no, 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 that's not a dog, that's a cat, okay? Well, now I've learned that I put the animals that look like this, that have a tail and they're furry and they bark, I'm going to put that in the dog category. Animals that are furry with a tail and they meow, I'm going to put in the cat category. And so this is kind of how schemas are built. These are these sort of mental structures that allow us to categorize information very quickly. So as you build language and as you build these skills, you start to be able to perhaps expand these boxes or contract them. So maybe um, dog includes uh, um, uh, Great Danes. Right. So that might include uh, Great Dane types of dogs. It includes beagles. It includes really fuzzy dogs. It includes not very fuzzy dogs. Cats might include, you know, you might include in this tigers as well as the domestic house cat. Right. They're still kind of added into this sort of category. As we move along and get more mature in our processes, then these boxes usually do get a little bit tighter. Right. Now. If we think about schemas in the same fashion, you have a schema for everything. You have a schema, for example, for a movie theater. So if you go to a movie theater, okay, you're going to expect certain things to fall in this box, okay? You're going to expect to see a big screen. You might expect to see a carpeted floor. Um, you might expect to see a concession stand, right? And so all of these things are going to meet your expectations of what a, a movie theater should have. And as you gain more experience, this box might change a little bit. Maybe you go to a movie theater that serves dinner. 
Well, that's going to change your schema and expectations for the next movie theater that you go to. Maybe you go visit the movie theater in Bristol and see that they have reclining seats. And that's the first time you've ever seen a reclining seat. And you go, oh, well, this is the expectation that I have now for every theater that I go to, right? All of this information is for us to organize our thoughts better so that that way when we move on to the next thing, we know what to expect without having to put a lot of controlled thinking into it. So that automatic thinking can then generate new uh, and, and improved schemas. So when we develop these schemas, that's going to influence the information that we're going to notice about the thing that we're going to think about and that we're going to remember. If everything fits into our schema, we might not have any new information that we add to that schema. Therefore, it doesn't modify, it doesn't change. We also have schemas about people. So if I were to say right now, okay, let's do an exercise. I want you to draw a librarian. Okay. I want you just sort of uh, grab a sheet of paper and just doodle a librarian. What do you think a librarian looks like? What do you think um, a medical doctor looks like? Okay. What do you think a scientist looks like? And what do you think uh, a nurse looks like? And what do you think an engineer looks like? So pause the video, draw these, each one of these. Okay. Jot it down on a sheet of paper and then unpause it and come back. So generally speaking, when we task people with drawing librarians, doctors, scientists, nurses, and engineers, as you can imagine, people are going to have schemas about their particular thoughts of what a person in this um, field should look like. So a lot of times people would draw a librarian as a woman with glasses and a bun in her hair, right? They may draw a medical doctor as a man in a medical uh, lab coat with a stethoscope. A scientist a lot of times is also drawn as a man, uh, might have a beaker in his hand. A nurse is usually drawn as a woman with a stethoscope around her neck and scrubs on. Engineers a lot of times drawn as a man. Sometimes people draw themselves in each one of these roles, but usually we see a bit of a gendered schema when it comes to certain positions in certain fields. So we know that men can be nurses, women can be doctors, we know that women can be engineers and mathematicians, and men can be librarians, but we develop these schemas because it's what we're used to seeing. It fits in the box. If you are used to seeing male nurses, because maybe your dad is a nurse or your brother is a nurse, then that's going to change your schema. It's going to change what you remember about the information. Let's say your schema is usually that a woman is a nurse. Maybe the first time you really notice a man being a, do uh, being a nurse, okay, you're going to remember that information because it doesn't fit your schema. And that's going to then in the future modify your schema, but that's going to be the information that you remember about that situation because it is different from what you're used to. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to, I'm going to stop this video and I'm going to do this whole series in parts. And next we're going to talk about how we use automatic thinking with schemas. Okay. And we're going to talk about stereotypes. So we're going to get to that next and function. So I'm going to pause this and move to part two.